start our conversation, actually, the first question I would like to address to you today is that among the myriad and the turbulence that we live in, that we're seeing in the global shifts today as well, what do you see as uh, the top challenges for corporates, but also for boards? The world's boards, whether it is public sector, private sector, multinational, or for that matter, even in organizations like ours, all have had three factors constantly, three externalities which have compelled these companies, these boards, to think differently. So the key factors, in my opinion, are, number one, unlike in the past, climate emergency and the need for boards and companies and all organizations to embed sustainability in corporate strategy. I think the second big disruptive factor that every board member and every company needs to be aware of is that is the technology, the new technologies. And I think the ones who embed it fast, first, are going to have an insurmountable advantage. And the third and final one is geopolitics. You know, today we live in a world, a decision made in Washington, D.C. can almost disrupt and negate the shares a leading company in China has. And this is the reality we face. Now, of course, we're talking about these as being challenges, but we also, you see these as opportunities as well for corporates and boards. So can you tell us more about this? There are organizations, nations, and businesses, and uh, lots of companies which actually deny the existence of climate change emergency, right? Now, if we live in denial and not do anything about this, climate change will come and disrupt your supply chain. The opportunity is for companies to now begin to use artificial intelligence, use its predictive abilities to look at what are the potential dangers that every one of our supply chains are most vulnerable to. And once we have a good hang on all these key areas of potential disruption, we should be looking at creating optional supply chains, optional sources of supply to uh, ensure that we don't get caught completely unawares in terms of sustainability and climate emergency. Now we talk about the opportunity of technology. So I think what you have is a hesitancy on the part of more traditional company boards and leaders to want to embrace technology as a first mover. So we'll talk about artificial intelligence. China is ahead of the curve on artificial intelligence today because almost by rule, when you start digitizing the information of a billion people, I mean, that's a power that you can use in so many ways. And China is probably doing this much better than most nations. I want to also talk to you about the opportunity of nanotechnology. Most of the predictions that have been done using global trends shows that by 2025, many of the Southern Hemisphere nations where 70% of the world's population lives, are going to be struggling for water. However, we have a great big ocean where 75% of the earth is covered with it. But it's salt water, but we need fresh water. So one of the amazing new nanotechnology op op opportunities that we can leverage is the whole development of graphene. Today, graphene is probably the best option for water desalination at low cost. And there are two or three nations which have mastered this. I mean, the last one is geopolitics. As we get to the 21st century, we are seeing it as Asia's century. And one cannot hide behind the fact that China is beginning to consolidate itself economically. They today are the world leaders in the mobilization of AI. They are the world leaders in electric rail. <laughs> 
uh, robotic mobilization and a whole uh, mobilizing the opportunity of working with China then to bring these things from a geopolitical point of view into companies, into businesses where businesses can form joint ventures. To me, that's a leveraging of geopolitics to advantage as opposed to, you know, not uh, sitting back and watching all this happen. What's about CSR versus ESG? So the first E of any business should be an economic growth business model which drives sustainability, sustainable growth, sustainable innovation. Now, then governance is important. I would call it a hygiene factor that should pervade every part of the business. Because if you don't have governance and if you don't have ethics, then you begin to compromise a whole bunch of other things. Then you can have environmental sustainability, which means that every board member understands that resources are limited. They're not unlimited. And we are diminishing. And just to give you two quick facts on resources, if you look at global forest cover, it has, by 2018, it had diminished to 70% of the planet. 70% has been wiped out. So we are left with 30%. Then you have social sustainability. Because at the end of the day, the human being has to also progress. You know, it's not about a world where 1% of the world's wealthy have 52% of the world's wealth. <laughs> and that equation is not going to work. The, the new mindset is a stakeholder uh, winning all stakeholders. And the, the society is a stakeholder. Employees are stakeholders, the communities are stakeholders, the environment is a stakeholder, and we need to make sure we balance this. And all of this should be underpinned by governance. So I think that, to me, is the future. Now to get to the word CSR. What most companies ended up doing was they called it corporate social responsibility, and they ended up doing a lot of good, but they were doing good with the purpose of looking good, as opposed to ensuring that you had a sustainable business model. You wrote a book which is Strategic Corporate Sustainability. And in this book, you highlight seven imperatives that actually um, impede the establishment of a sustainable business. Now, can you tell us about these imperatives, the ideas, and how do these apply to boards? The first common imperative was that if the CEO, the chairman, or the managing director, or let's call him the president, or the prime minister, was not a triple bottom line mindset person, that strategy never got embedded in the company's corporate strategy. So this then makes it imperative for boards the second one was to ensure that they had, there was a governance structure that enabled the boards to function so that the chairman was leading this whole operation from a sustainable mindset. And then the CEO was leading the business from an operations mindset, but both looking at sustainability and the embedding sustainability in the strategies. The third imperative was the framing of sustainability. So if you position the subject as a save the planet only agenda, we found that it was unlikely to take traction in companies. However, if you position climate emergency and sustainability as a business growth opportunity, as a new business model opportunity, then everyone begins to embrace this. Fourth imperative is that every company who really embeds sustainability, who had embedded sustainability, had only one strategy. They did not have two strategies. The second one gets probably a little time during lunch breaks. But the real strategy that drives the nation or the company is the national strategy and the corporate strategy. So 
to me, the fourth imperative was the companies who succeeded doing well had brought them together as one strategy. The fifth imperative was to also understand the need for measure, measuring your impact on the environment, measuring uh, your carbon footprint and your water footprints. So if you don't measure your sustainability impacts or triple bottom line impacts, then you can't correct them. The sixth one is to look at all stakeholders. Managing stakeholders was a fine art in these companies who had embedded sustainability. The last uh, imperative is companies who really took sustainability forward, who took strategic corporate sustainability forward, were the companies who realized that the R&D, their entire innovation process, had to be completely anchored in sustainable innovation and not just innovation. We know that there is no size fits all to address sustainability agenda at the board, in the corporations, <clears throat> all of this. With your experience working with government bodies and boards, um, basically, what do you see in a way, how can directors do better? How can they integrate sustainability? How can they address it from your experience? I think there are two words that are coming to my mind. One is short-termism, and the other one is strategic focus. Now, the key reason short-termism has won in every possible board or national level is because you are rewarded for short-term profits. If you, sustainability is a strategic concept. It is not a short-term concept. You know, you can't save the planet this morning, this week, right? It's what you do each day in the next 12 years, as the UN is now talking about, that will give us a chance to either sustain this planet or completely reverse all the gains this planet has made with catastrophic climate emergency. Now, the first area that needs to be attacked and changed is the reward system. You know, the first thing I hear when I go into a pub public sector board or serve on an NGO board is, we are not for profit, right? We are there to serve, serve the people or, and serve the need. You see, when you have that ethos, then your business model, your entire national growth model is no longer sustainable. In the NGOs that I work with, or I'm on the board on, I find that every month at a board meeting, we are talking of a cash deficit. And you know, everyone's hoping for the next uh, big donation. And you know, if, you, if your business model is one of hope, for, the, for, for generous donations, NGOs can never succeed. So one of the simple concepts that are necessary for public sector board operations, NGO operations, and national growth operations is to have business models or national growth models which deliver a profit. Profit must not be seen as a bad word but must be seen as the lifeblood that makes it possible for a nation, a business, an NGO to survive into the future. I think in the two parts of the equation, on one side, we have to bring urgency and understanding yet strategic concepts to the public and uh, national sectors in terms of triple bottom line at the board levels, but into the private sector and the MNCs, we had to bring them much more sensitivity to the environmental resource management and societal growth. So I think at a board level, we have to bring leaders finally on both sides who look at things from a triple bottom line mindset. So it's a balancing act in a way. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an absolute balancing act. Sustainability and triple bottom line is a strategic concept. It is not about delivering amazing results next quarter. Now, you mentioned earlier 
you know, nanotechnology, AI, and moving into the technological disruption, we are today navigating through a transformational phase, which is very interesting for boards, for us, for corporates. Now, what do you see the key questions boards should be asking? No single human being <laughs> or organization can have within itself all the resources required to make strategic decisions. And the starting point for me at a board level is to acknowledge that we do not have all the knowledge, all the resources available sitting around the table to make the kind of decisions that are required under the three headings of climate emergence embracing new technology and in terms of geopolitical reality. The questions that have to be asked at a board level is, number one, are we getting the best knowledge about what is the latest on climate emergency and how will that affect our business, you know, our industry, our sector? Number two, what is the competition doing right now? to circumnavigate these challenges. What should we be doing? So the board discussions, unfortunately, are about last month's results and the next month's target. The board's role now has to change from looking at yesterday to looking at tomorrow and five years ahead and constantly asking the question, what will change? The smart ones who really help nations thrive, who let businesses succeed, are the ones who have seen today and understood tomorrow, today, and started doing something about it, as opposed to being like the famous Emperor Nero. When Rome was burning, all he did was continue to play the fiddle. Well, thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you for your insights.